Hello everybody, I'm Andrew Harvey and I am absolutely thrilled to about to be plunging into a conversation with somebody whom you must meet. Eric Jumper Anderson has just written what I consider to be a masterpiece, a true masterpiece, a book called Unseen Beings. And if I had my way, which I rarely do, I would make it obligatory reading for every human being and for every seeker because what Eric has managed to do in a very brief, very concise, very compact, brilliantly written book is to present the vision of our real world that we now need to embrace and integrate on every level of our consciousness and our action in order to survive the global dark night that we are in. I cannot tell you how thrilled I was to read this book and to reread it and to take extensive notes from it and to learn from it. I am so honored, Eric, to meet you and so absolutely gobsmacked and flabbergasted by all the enormity of work that went into presenting your great vision. And I cannot tell you how wonderful I feel your book is and how much I feel it deserves the highest respect and the largest possible audience and, of course, the greatest possible sales. Oh, thank you very much. That's really... Uh, I. Yeah, as as I I've told you before, I'm I'm incredibly deeply grateful to have been able to have you read it and to receive your feedback, um, and to be able to be here with you right now. I uh, I'm deeply enjoying your book, and I look forward to reading other books of yours as well. I I really you know I think it's very evident for both of us that that we're very much on the same page about oh a lot God. of these things. And as I I said earlier. Um, it was it was really quite surreal a lot of times uh, while reading your book to to read lines that felt so similar to things that I have been thinking and things that I attempted to get through uh, in unseen beings. But I yeah very much kindred spirits and I I really appreciate you having me here and to be able to have this conversation with you. Let's begin by me asking you to tell us something of your story. Here you are coming out with unseen beings. Who are you? What do you want to? What's your journey been? We need you, and we want to know you. It's a it's a great question. It's it's a question that I, I you know <laughs> constantly ask myself that, and uh, I'm I'm a work in progress. But I've I, I fell into these kinds of worlds and conversations and paths quite early on in life for a number of reasons. Um, you know, sort of intrinsic reasons and also um, from external circumstances that, you know, sort of shifted my life in certain directions and, and forced me to grapple with certain things mm -hmm. at, you know, a fairly young age. And I, I've always been a seeker since I was very young, really as, as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. I've always been deeply, uh, easily kindled by experiences of enchantment mm -hmm. and also by animals, really, especially, uh, you know, that was, I think, a, a gateway for me in a lot of ways to really come into an experience of, of kinship, of connection, of relationship, and of the, the real genuine experience of enchantment that arises from a meeting of minds. And it was, you know, simple relationship with my childhood dog, to whom the, the book is dedicated. Um, <laughs> he's the, the star uh, to whom the book is dedicated. But that, that really, you know, changed my life in a lot of ways. Also some traumatic experiences in childhood, my brother's death, uh, and also sort of grappling with an acknowledgement, an unavoidable acknowledgement that I am fundamentally different from most of the people that I was around and having to sort of navigate that and find, uh, you know, ways to, to find a world that I could actually exist in, understanding mm -hmm. that the world that had been sort of handed to me that I had been, you know, dropped into wasn't really suitable. 
and dealing with that dissonance, the dissonance between what I really felt to be true and what other people were telling me was true. So that pushed me into, you know, spirituality before any sort of proper um, religious interests, which came a bit later. Uh, you know, I dabbled in, in the occult, as one might say. I, you know, I, I had my time with tarot cards and with palmistry and with, you know, astrology and I Ching and so on when I was very young. And that sort of led me into uh, exploring literature and fantasy. Um, I always credit J.R.R. Tolkien as being one of the most important influences in my life. He remains that uh, for me today. I actually just came back from Oxford today. I was visiting a friend uh, last night and today and, you know, went to my, my usual Tolkien sites and, you know, sort of paid homage to really someone who was a kind of first guru for me. Um, but what, what his work really did was open me up to enchantment, gave me an opportunity to see the world through an enchanted lens. Mm -hmm. And after doing that, it became impossible to go back to a disenchanted world. So that forced me to ask more questions and to try to find real world traditions that I could sink my teeth into uh, that would you know, come with the air of legitimacy that I felt like I needed. Uh, I'm in a slightly different place with that today than I was 20 years ago, but at that point, uh, you know, I was really trying to explore different religions, uh, different, you know, established spiritual traditions to find something that, that felt right, that really spoke to me. And I cycled through a lot. I explored a lot of different options, uh, one might say. But Buddhism is ultimately what really settled for me. That was what, what called me most strongly. And, you know, it was a book on Zen meditation originally, and then I read some sutras, and then I started reading some Tibetan Buddhist materials. And that immediately enchanted me. It gave me a similar sort of flavor uh, to what I had experienced with Tolkien's work, though very different, coming from very different foundations, but pointing towards a really similar uh, sort of truth in a sense and also a similar experience of enchantment so for the past 20 years i mean i've i've spent the vast majority of that time deeply involved in the tibetan buddhist tradition i met my my root teacher when i was 14 years old lama tultra wow. malione uh so i was incredibly lucky with that it was quite a strange it was a strange occurrence because i had read um you know i'd read some books about Tibetan Buddhism, and I had sort of established that I wanted to be a Nyingmapa, uh, you know, at one of the four major schools of Tibetan Buddhism, and I had really sort of committed myself to that and started telling my classmates and my teachers and my parents <laughs> that I'm a Nyingmapa. I was in a Christian school at the time also, which really didn't, uh, didn't yeah. help, so it didn't go over too great. Uh, and then I, I discovered that there was a teacher an hour away from my house in rural Colorado uh, who was a Nyingma Lama at wow. a you know big retreat center in Colorado. So I ended up spending a lot of time there. I started spending summers there. I started working there. Uh, and I studied Tibetan ritual arts really intensively and Chud, uh, which is my, my heart practice. Mm. And I ended up, you know, I was an actor once upon a time, and I, I I dropped all of that to do Tibetan studies. I was I felt like that was really what I had to do, uh, so I I wandered around a bit. I went to Naropa University, um, but then I I dropped out in order to do Tibetan medicine school, yes. which took up many many years of my life, <laughs> the majority of the past. But that's one of the great years. strengths of your work is that it's also very grounded in science. You've obviously spent a great deal of time studying very different forms of science with great intensity. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the history of science. Mm. You know, that's, that's a, a topic, it's, it's an, an area of the research that I'm doing now that's become very important. Uh, you know, in, in recent years, I've sort of moved away from like clinical practice. And I'd say that, you know, spiritually, my path has shifted a lot in the past five years uh, in some really, I think, important ways. Uh, it's felt, you know, a little bit more of a grounding process. Yes. And, and I bet that the world crisis has grounded you. Yeah. The realization that we are actually facing potential Ab extinction yeah, means absolutely. that we've got to get it together. All of it, all of the wisest perspectives have to come together to infuse us with a new vision that we can fight peacefully for and realize ourselves. Totally. Through. Yes. Absolutely. It's been really interesting to watch this sort of progression and to look at it historically as well. What I'm, what I'm doing now, um, I'm, I'm finishing a master's in history at the moment and preparing to apply 
apply for doctoral programs. Uh, but I'm, I'm focusing on, on history. I've sort of, you know, my Tibetan medical work and my Tibetan Buddhist studies uh, has sort of dovetailed into more academic research. Uh, and I'm working with a, my supervisor here in, in London, uh, Ronit Yoy Tlalim. She's mm -hmm. a Silk Road scholar who specializes mm -hmm. in the transmission of knowledge across the ancient world uh, and also the history of medicine, the history of science. And those those topics have really, I mean, they were a major influence in actually getting this book out and in establishing some of the, the methodologies and sort of approaches that I took with it for precisely, you know, the, the reason that understanding the history of science, the history of the philosophy of science, yes. the ways that we have thought about the world and characterized the world that we live in and tried to make sense of it over time and the ways that that's evolved and shifted and devolved uh, in very significant ways, often both simultaneously, yes. is quite fascinating. And, you know, I, I felt and terrifying. Really and and ter <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, precisely. Yes. Yeah. Let's take the jump now because yeah. you chose to become a Tibetan Buddhist. Tibetan Buddhism is in its very nature scientific. The Buddha is the supreme scientist of consciousness. And you've married your passionate search for awakening with this very specific passion for science. And yeah. I think that in doing that, you're mirroring the new global heart mind that's trying to be born right now. Yeah. Because and I know you know this better than I do, but what has been revealed to me is that science has undergone two major interconnected revolutions in the last 40 years, both of which you know and explore in your book, but both of which detonate the fantasy of human-centeredness yeah. that is your central yeah. theme. So let me just speak about those revolutions and then we'll plunge into the central story that you are desperately and brilliantly trying to destroy in your book so that we can be released from it. It's time and you do a hell of a job in blowing it up. The Burn it down. <laughs> Let's do it. Let it go. It's time. Let it go. It's got to go. The yeah. first one is obviously the great revolution of quantum physics, the knowledge that is now coming to us of a completely interconnected, fabulously weird, enchanted, entangled universe that is a intercommuning web of energies. Yeah. That blows apart any sense that we are unique in our consciousness. It shows Absolutely. to many that there is this unspeakably brilliant intelligent consciousness that is interconnecting absolutely everything and manifesting out of light energy the entire creation, which of course is Shunyata in the Buddhist tradition, is the Godhead in the Christian tradition, is the Nirguna Brahman in the Hindu tradition. It's been known by mystics, but now it's been confirmed by science. But the other great revolution, which doesn't get anywhere near the attention that it deserves, is the revolution that you're celebrating mostly in your book, which made me want to dance to Tina Turner, my favorite. Oh. She's, oh. Gone, up, she's gone up to the Dharmakaya, where she will rest for a while, but thank God she was here. But it made me want to dance because you understand this revolution. And it's an unbelievably important revolution. It's a revolution in our understanding of the consciousness of animals and of plants and of trees. The consciousness mm -hmm. that is vibrant in every single aspect of the creation. Mm -hmm. And when you bring together these two great revolutions, you realize that unless we align ourselves with them and radically reorder the mad story that we've been telling ourselves, that we are the supreme beings on this planet, the supreme apex of creation, yes. which has led to devastation on a world level, Absolutely. unless we do that now and urgently and passionately and along the lines that you've so carefully sculpted in this book, we're going to die out. But if we can do this, and your book is such a trumpet call to this revolution. If we can do this, then a wholly new world, the real world, 
opens up in front of us and we have something magical, enchanted, thrilling, exciting to fight peacefully for with all of our considerable abilities. So let's begin by something, I'm being bossy now because I'm old, but I want, I'm so thrilled to be talking to you. I want to read out to everybody my favorite sentence towards the end of your book, which I think is so brilliant and says it all. Are you ready? I'm very our interested to know which one is good. <laughs> our alienation from nature has made us less healthy, less safe, less compassionate, and less fulfilled. Anthropocentrism is ideological metafetamine compelling us ruthlessly towards violence, self-aggrandizement, and complete desensitization to the needs and experiences of others. If I had my way, I would write that in gold letters outside the UN and make everybody read it. That's why your analogy that it's a metafetamine is so brilliant. Exactly. Because it gives you a exactly. rush to think you're superior and separate and, and in control. Absolutely. But that's a barren, empty rush compared to the kind of exhilaration and joy and rapture that you can experience when you are initiated into the magic of the real world. Absolutely. I, there's someone driving by with music very loudly right now, which I think is perfect for yes. the description of the it's rapturous yes. joy that is that is intrinsic in our experience. I mean, the, yes. you know, the, the enchantment is nothing other than the experience of actually encountering another being, actually encountering yes. another mind. We experience enchantment every time we fall in love. We obviously experience it as you, you illustrate so beautifully in your book, um, the one that I've, I've read. Uh, and I'm sure in many others, but we, you know, we encounter it when we when we come face to face with our pets, with animals, with yes. you know other beings that we that we create that connection with. And you know, I believe well, that it, your relationship with your dog was the crucial beginning. You absolutely, said to yourself. But in that relationship, you must have understood that your dog's consciousness was extremely elevated, absolutely. just as rich and complex as yours. Yeah, it was. It and was really. I mean, that was a big part love. of. Yeah, yeah the, this was a big part of what led me to Buddhism in the first place. Right. Was, you know, my at my my thirteen year old understanding of Buddhism, uh, which as soon as I, I became Buddhist, I also became vegetarian, and I, I never really looked back from that. Um, and have more recently, uh, you know, transitioned into veganism, but that's not really the point. Uh, but I mean, my my decision to become Buddhist was absolutely linked to my love of animals and my concern for the fact that the religion and the religious environments that I was brought up in completely disregarded oh that. Yeah. Uh, so you know it, the one that evil theologian said that animals existed to keep meat fresh. That was how. Yeah, it yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's funny, but it's so horrific. No, exactly, exactly. I mean, people like you know Thomas Aquinas also. I mean, he he made the point. Um, which you make in your book, which is a very, you make it very intelligently and very poignantly with the understanding that there's more to it. But, you know, he essentially said that cruelty to animals is wrong for the, for the mere purpose that if you're cruel to animals, you're more likely to be cruel to humans. But presumably, if you're only cruel to animals, then that's fine. There's no consequence for that in a, a sort of, you know, in many theological circles from many different traditions. Uh, but, you know, that it is obviously true that cruelty towards animals is uh, it not only leads into cruelty towards humans, it is, it is an expression of our fundamental um, cruelty arising from trauma and alienation, arising from our, our perceived separation from this world, uh, which is, is fed by so many different paradigms which appear to be so positive. <coughs> so authoritative and Absolutely. are sick and demented when you wake up. Absolutely. It comes back into the book because I'm dying to really get all yeah. the richness of this book. Yeah, I, I've yeah, been yeah, yeah. For hours, but look, what's so exciting about your book is first of all that you really dive into the exploding this anthropocentric story, showing that it has afflicted all of the patriarchal religions. 
Mm, yeah. It's afflicted absolutely our entire scientific way of thinking until very recently. And it's something that we absolutely have to get over, not just because it's wrong, but because it's now lethally destructive to our potential survival in a global dark night that is yeah. threatening all of life. That's yeah. the great thesis of your book. And my God, it's so beautifully done. But then you then, what is so wonderful about your book, is having said that, you plunge into really three areas in which you explore consciousness. The first area is animals, and the second area is trees. And the third area, which I must say was the one that I learned the most from, is plants and even slime molds. And this is where your scientific passion and your scientific curiosity, the scientific curiosity that links you to that second revolution that I was describing, uh. is so important. So could you dance with those three categories, animals, trees, and plants? Because that's the substantial richness of your book in yeah. opening up to us the enchantment of those realms. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's really interesting because we've had we've had some really significant scientific revolutions in the past few hundred years as a whole, and some of them have been incredibly destructive, uh, but also not novel. They arise from a lineage, which you know I talk about, you know, the sort of Platonic and Aristotelian philosophical traditions and the ways that those were really integrated into, especially Christianity. Uh, and into a lot of major, you know, dominant world and religions. And into Islam and into Judaism. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. And then ultimately taken up uh, in sort of, you know, the dawn of modernity by folks like Descartes. Oh. Um, and also, you know, I don't talk about Carl Linnaeus in the book, which I regret. Um, I talked about him a bit in a draft, but I was 20,000 words over. So this book was, was pretty significantly edited. Um, but, you know, the Linnaean system of classification, which is still theoretically a basis of how we look at the world, looking at species, dividing them up, giving them Latin names and saying, you know, this is this kind of being and they, they're like this, this and this. Uh, he was also the father of scientific approaches to racism. He's the one that established the concept of different human races. And his whole conceptualization of the, the so-called natural world, um, with the concept of nature is something else that I try to deconstruct a little bit in the book. Uh, but his conceptualization of nature was debunked quite quickly when Charles Darwin came onto the yes. scene. Uh, and when we had really this, you know, this major revolution in our understanding of the biological world and uh, the recognition that we are in fact all related, the recognition that there are no human races, there is in fact only one human race, um, and uh, that you know we are we are distantly related to slime molds and fungi and plants and trees and every single animal. Which is something and, that reincarnation has always acknowledged. Absolutely. That we are uh, holograms of the entire evolutionary process. We've been uh, participating in it from the very beginning, and we are its flower at the moment. Absolutely. And it's important. It's important to a point that you made before. Um, you know, it's important for us to recognize, I think, that this paradigm that we identify as being this sort of predominant, you know, almost universal, uh, you know, presupposition about the nature of the world is not in fact universal at all for the not vast majority of human history. It's not native to majority. indigenous people, it's not native to Hindus, that Absolutely. it's not native to Buddhists, it's not native to Taoists. Absolutely. There are at least a billion, 500 million people on the planet who don't share any of this. Exactly, and for the vast majority of human history, almost every single human society has not agreed with this, has come to radically different conclusions yes. about our position in the world and our relations with other than human beings. And I think it's important for folks to really understand what that actually means. Yes. Because when we say, you know, when someone says that, you know, humans are the most intelligent beings in the world, they're the only beings with a rational soul, they're the only ones with true consciousness, with agency, uh, you know, when we talk about anthropomorphism, etc. The only ones with language, the, all yeah, of yeah. it's horseshit. Exactly. It's horseshit. It's exactly. not true. It's a and fantasy. It's Precisely. And it's not only it's not only horseshit, it's horseshit with a very specific lineage. With it's a akin... specific purpose too of domination. Precisely. Yes. Exactly. It's, it's, it's no different than saying... consciousness. Absolutely. 
it's it's no different than talking about you know the the concept of specifically a thrice omni god who sends his son to be sacrificed for the sins of humanity because of the original fall of man because eve ate, for, ate from the garden ate and right. that story when we hear that we know immediately that's the christian story that comes from this place it came from this time period it has these specific right. influences it went through this lineage it affected these cultures in this way we know that it's a specific idea we would n no one would assume that an indigenous person in the Amazon or in Canada or in Australia would have come up with the same story because it's not an observation about the world that you can have, you know, multiple discoveries yes. of. It's a specific idea. And the anthropocentrism is no different. Right. You know, our, especially the way that we conceptualize it, that is the same exact thing. That's something that we can look at as a belief system with its own lineage, its own influences. And as such, we can recognize that it's not empirical true it's a story it's a story, it's that, a story people hold. that you point out has one very intelligent and extraordinary origin and that is that the power that we gain through telling ourselves that story exactly the amazing yeah. technologies that we were able to create out of our fantasy of superiority yeah. only increased our addiction to that story and only increased yeah. the danger of that addiction because it's founded in a fundamental separation from the enchanted truth of reality. Absolutely. And it led to disastrous, it's, it's led to disastrous consequences for thousands of years, but for the past 500 years, especially. It's potentially lethal consequences. Exactly. I mean, you know, we talk about the impending, you know, apocalypse. We talk about the anthropocene. Well, it's not we impending. About, We're in it's it. It's not impending at all. It's, you know, we, we talk about climate change. I don't know what is. Yes. Exactly. You know, yeah. we, we speak about climate change, changing climates as this unexpected accidental consequence of progress which we're just starting to realize and to deal with whoops our mistake we didn't mean to do that and now we can just fidget with the the numbers and the systems and make it more sustainable that's not the reality we have been that's intentionally what you say. i love that world. phrase i want to just celebrate one of your other favorite phrases which i'm going to steal of course oh, please. Is yeah please, please, yeah. our approach to climate change is like putting a neon bandage on a melanoma <laughs> yeah. it's yeah, still yeah. addicted to the belief that we have somehow the skills to change this totally and thinking that progress is consciousness we will not be able to change anything unless we go through a Precisely. revolution of consciousness because only that will give us the wisdom to know what we're really dealing with exactly you know even if if we were to dis tomorrow discover a limitless source of clean energy oh. and we were to be able to create a sustainable economy a sustainable world we were able to sustain the world that we have created we wouldn't we wouldn't fix anything that is not a solution no. I, that doesn't mean that we don't need to divest from fossil fuels it doesn't mean that we don't need to transition no, to, to but clean we energy would make but a mess of it because we're exactly. in the wrong mindset heart set soul set exactly look what ai is threatening us with on the one hand fantastic totally. possibilities and the, on the other hand even by the admission of the people who created it it could destroy humanity that if exactly. that isn't an illustration of the need for a complete revolution like the one that you are promulgating, mm. what is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about trees and animals, trees and plants. Just give us a, just an insight into what yeah. the beautiful book celebrates. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the animals I... I wanted to start with plants in the book. I think I did. I don't actually remember how it ended up turning out with that, but I wanted to, I wanted to focus on plants a bit and I wanted to start with plants for a few reasons. Um, one of which being that we cannot avoid that we consume plants. So it forces us to deal with sticky ethical and moral oh conundrums God, yes. without having that piece of an expectation that we're going to become breatharian without realizing that they're sentient and that they we cause them pain exactly. by eating them so part of our involvement with exactly. is accepting that precisely difference. and we have to recognize that violence is a form of of relationship this is yes. a point that you make in in your book as well that yes. is really really important for people to understand because i've, I've had so many conversations and how we today. deal with that violence how we exactly control that violence how we apologize and sacralize precisely that violence that's what the indigenous traditions can teach us to do. Precisely. And when you look yeah. at a tradition like Jainism, where the, yeah. the ethic is to cause as little harm as possible, 
that becomes incredibly powerful when we consider, like the Jains did, that that plants are also very much sentient yes. beings. Buddhism avoided this yes. um, for very pragmatic reasons. You know, if assuming that there was a historical Buddha that aligns with the figure that we know from the sutras, assuming that he indeed denied the sentience of plants, then he made a mistake. He was wrong. We, yeah. we know that he was wrong about that, if he in fact said that. He was and wrong he about so many he, things, we can forgive him that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He was also wrong about women for three oh, rounds yes. of people, yeah. women asking if they could be in a sangha, and he said no, and no, no. Everybody has been wrong yeah. about women, except for Jesus, the real Jesus, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's, you know, it's these are all... Um, you know, these are, are semi-legendary or mythic historical figures who were human beings with that, you know, were, were fallible. All, all humans have, you know, we have our, our failings and that's important to recognize and important for us to be able to evolve in our own understanding of these traditions so it doesn't become stagnated right. and concretized without the possibility for an expansion of our knowledge. You know, as our knowledge expands, our our ways of living should also shift and, and the yes. ways that we view the world should also change. So science has an incredible part in that. Animal intelligence, again, non-Western, non-modern, pre-modern societies have known anything. this forever. <laughs> you know, I, I talk about animism in the book as being something that is, is it is primary, it, it is not unevolved it's not primitive in the sense that it's unevolved it's primary foundational in the sense that that is the basic way of approaching the it's world it's the foundational I, wisdom of exactly. race and of absolutely reality. Yes. And everyone is animistic. It's yes. not just humans. Animals are naturally animistic. Plants yes. are naturally animistic. Fungi are naturally animistic. Microbes that are naturally animistic. connects everything in nature. That's the way in exactly. which everything in nature is connected. Through. It's the only way that you can exist in a in a yes. you know a plural world, so that you can engage with other beings. You know yes. when plants hear the sounds of bees buzzing you know they don't assume that these are just mindless objects they're relating them with the, relating to them as other kinds of beings and that's pragmatically beneficial for everyone but it also is just the way that things actually are that is that is the clear it, view it, it of the world it isn't just pragmatic it's also that plants have this marvelous relationship to music which is well absolutely and absolutely. that shows that plants have a capacity for taste and bliss why not Absolutely. They have, they have, no they have all Good of the choice. senses that we have, and then some. They are there, you know. And this yeah. is this is the great sort of revolution. The animal stuff, I think, is interesting. I wanted to really focus in talking about animals on the ways that our humanness has been shaped by animals. I talk about dogs and wolves, as you do in your book as well. Um, and you the ways much that, you know, that actually, you say very categorically that. Our characterization of animal nature has been terribly flawed because we've associated it with everything we don't like in ourselves, yeah, rather absolutely. than accepting that we are animals. Absolutely, and exactly. I'm quoting you, physiologically and cognitively complex, because animals are physiologically and cognitively complex. That's absolutely. a revolution in itself. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I mean, it's, you know, it's been knocking that has been knocking on our door for so long you know they've been it, we have been we have been there science has been there science is there i don't think there's a single well science like, hasn't actual, been there for very long i mean look at Descartes. no He's no but today i mean yes, i don't i i yeah. doubt that there is any serious animal behaviorist in the world that genuinely believes that animals are non-sentient unconscious beings right. the evidence is is unavoidable at this point and but still the popular assumption about animals remains cartesian yes. you know for the average person if you know not saying every average person but for a lot of folks if you stop someone on the street and you start to you know push them on animal rights, then they're going to fall back on Cartesian uh, arguments Absolutely. about the fact that animals are biological automata. Car Descartes based that upon Aristotelian philosophy, or Aristotle based it on, you know, Plato's right. work. Um, but yeah. also Plato and Aristotle weren't trying to establish a universal theory about everything. They were just no. writing down some musings about the world at that time. <laughs> well, Descartes yeah. is, is much more powerful in that way. Yeah. But um, surely but it's not just the, let's get real, because it's not only the scientists who, the, the Cartesian approach that has damaged our relationship with animals, it's also the approach of all of the religions, including Buddhism. Absolutely. Buddhism says, you know, we are the ultimately privileged one because we have the capacity yeah. for liberation. This is yeah, yeah. horseshit. Yeah, absolutely. My, absolutely. my cat is already liberated. 100%. She's in a state of unified force field intelligence and bliss and peace 
peace and serenity, Absolutely. which I am trying to desperately to learn from every single day of my life. Yeah. And the native traditions, the indigenous traditions have always known this. Animals Absolutely. were prized not only for their incredible strength and skill, but for their consciousness that 100%. human beings had the humility to realize was as great, if not greater. Exactly. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really, it's bizarre in, and plants, you know, we'll get to plants yeah. in a second, but you know, it's, it's really bizarre that in a tradition like, like Buddhism, especially, which really highly values certain ways of being, uh, which are very much representative, uh, very much, you know, uh, you know, exemplified in the animal kingdom, yes. but also in the plant kingdom. Yes. You know, the, and Inter it's not union, I, interrelation, mutual absolutely. cooperation, mutual compassion. Absolutely. Yes. And, the, you know, and it's not entirely outside of the, the sort of the mythos of Buddhism. It may be outside of the ethical paradigms that were established with Buddhism for pragmatic reasons of avoiding uh, the, the confusion surrounding but it's dietary ethics. Buddhism, unfortunately, like all the patriarchal religions, has not got a deep enough understanding of the sacred feminine. Absolutely. That was the Absolutely. problem from the very beginning, and it has never healed that problem, nor is Hinduism, nor is Christianity, nor, because it's the sacred feminine, it's the mother that gives the vision yeah. of the absolute holiness of absolutely everything that exists, and the absolutely. unique beauty and dignity of absolutely everything. Absolutely. And, I mean, she's, obviously, she is represented in, in Mahayana to a certain extent. She's yes, represented they all, in, they in all give it, They all throw her a bone or two, but they yeah, exactly. incorporate exactly. the full mm -hmm. radiant challenge challenging wisdom exactly. of her glory absolutely absolutely agree. and that's the tragedy of the, of the human experience yeah we but, only have a few minutes because we could go on forever but i'd love in this uh, last part yeah. because everybody's going to read your book now unseen beings everyone read this book give it to everybody you know it is amazing and it's you know one of the things before we go into this last part one of the things i love so much about your book is that it's absolute simplicity of approach. You approach with total clarity, total simplicity. You guide us through. You don't pamper your audience. You go for the jugular, but you ground everything you say in such overwhelmingly enchanting evidence and scientific expression, spiritual knowledge, that by the end of the book, the reader who's really open feels that they have received a truth that they have been incohately longing for, but now can truly ground in themselves. Mm. That makes it a manifesto for human survival and human truth. Nothing less than that. And uh, what you've been able to do through this book is something really monumental. And I hope that millions of people will get to it because it has the possibility of truly affecting the kind of revolution of consciousness, beginning that revolution in a way that will be salvific and redemptive for the human race. It's a bodhisattvic task. You fulfilled it. I, I'm in awe and I congratulate you from my battered old heart. It's amazing. I really appreciate that. In the last part, you've, in this book you tell the horror of the story that is dooming us. You then bring fact bring forward all the enchanted information that reveals that we live in a magical, totally interconnected world, which we need deeply to respect and honor in all of its levels to be able to survive ourselves. Mm. What are the possible solutions, the possible ways forward that you've come to? I, I, I apologize for my cat. She was, she was calling incessantly at the door. Oh, what's her name? Luna. Luna. Oh, my, my cat is asleep in the sun, oh. the most beautiful she's, creature in the world, apart from Luna. She's, she's very upset that I was gone for a night, so now she uh, she's demanding she's claiming <laughs> for my full day. attention. Oh, God, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I... So the book is the book is structured exactly as you said. You know, I, I sort of followed really the model of the Buddha's Four Noble Truths, which are itself yes. uh, based on a medical paradigm that was used in Ayurveda, is used in all medical traditions Very really totally. around around the world, especially Eurasian traditions. But it's just the it's the medical approach, it's it's diagnosis, structure. etiology, it's prognosis, and, and treatment. Um, so you know, when coming to the treatment, I, I approach it, and you make this this really excellent point in your book as well. Um, 
you know, I th you said it's not a problem that can be solved, but a predicament that can only be responded to. And I think that that's really quite poignant. It reminds me of a point that Donna Haraway makes uh, about string games. You know, those games that kids play, or yes. at least when I was a kid, we still played them before we had iPads. Yes. <laughs> those I strings, and you make patterns, and then you hand it off, and the next person takes it and makes a new pattern, and then hands it off. And that that is the game that we are engaged in uh, as living beings, as humans in a more than human world, as you know, a, an array of different societies. We are constantly creating little diagrams with our strings and handing it off and someone else you know brings in their agency and creates something from it and then brings it back to us and so on um we we indeed are not in a position to to save nature or to save the world the very idea is that crazy. what we need is but we are in a position to align ourselves with the dazzling enchanting wisdom of nature we precisely can do that. and that that will guide exactly. us to solutions we can't even yet begin to imagine Exactly. And to, to understand that it's really a process of recovery. And this yeah. is the term that I use throughout, which I really I, I take from Tolkien specifically. He identifies escape, recovery and consolation as the three functions of a fairy story, the yes. three functions of myth in its most enchanting yes. and authentic and earnest form. They're the purpose of such stories, of such myths uh, are to enchant us, to uh, allow us to escape from the bondage of idealist, you know, uh, uh, ideological shackles and worldviews which do not serve us and which keep us imprisoned. So to be able to escape in the way that a prisoner escapes prison or an enslaved person escapes enslavement and to recover a sense of really what he defines as clear view, uh, yes. not meaning seeing things, uh, you know, as they truly are necessarily, but as we are meant to see them. And to, again, in his words directly, uh, to identify beings and things outside of us as things apart from us, as other kinds of beings, as other, other individuals, other persons. So he identifies this as, you know, the recovery of a clear view, which also carries this connotation of recovering from a disease. Yes. And I think that it's really important for us to characterize our process as, you know, anthropocentrism itself as a chronic disease, the Anthropocene it's a as a, a manifestation of a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So what we need is to recover. Uh, we don't need more progress in order to, you know, impose our will on the world to try to save it. Progress was from the, the European colonial perspective. They thought that they were they were perpetuating progress when they killed 50 million indigenous American peoples in only 100 years. They from their point of view, that was progress terraforming the United States and turning it into a neo Europe in Alfred Crosby's language. That was for them progress. Our destruction of nature, our attempt to, to improve upon nature, to take nature's base products and create something valuable out of it. In, in the colonial European human mind, that was itself progress. So when we look at our current predicament and we say, you know what this needs? need some more progress we should take a moment and step back and say ah that sounds that sounds oddly familiar and maybe we need to be a bit critical of that you know what we really need is to we need to recover a sense of what it means to be human in a more than human world that is what we need and in order to do that, I argue that we really need to tell different stories. Stories are the backbone of really at least what it means to be human. And surely other non-human beings also engage in some forms of storytelling. But for us especially, our societies, our self-identities, our cultures, our nations, our economies, our entire conception of what it is to be human is built from stories. Uh, stories are the reason that we have the world that we exist today and are the world that we exist in today is itself constructed of stories so you what we need is, is we need your, to tell new stories in your amazing book and perhaps this is a wonderful place to end our conversation you say i love this well i love the whole book i wish i could quote the whole book the choice that we have we can continue to poison ourselves with toxic truths concocted under false pretenses you couldn't say it better or heal ourselves with truthful myths that remind us of our fundamental embeddedness in the world. 
And Absolutely. your book, Unseen Beings, is a magnificent place for all of us to start learning these new myths that will help us embed ourselves in our burning world and give us the chance not to save the world and nature, but to save ourselves. Absolutely. So I thank you, my friend. And I wish you a tremendous success and a tremendous joy of your great achievement. And oh, you can count on so me as an ally to get the message out in any way you like. Uh, thank you so much. I, I deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate it. Uh, I, yeah, your support means a lot. And I'm so encouraged by the fact that these sorts of messages are becoming um, hearable, perceptible, that the, you know, people are actually coming time. around to, yeah, this is the now time. Now or never. Yeah. And, it, it, and it really, it is a paradigm shift. Where we have to learn what you're talking about or we'll die out. It's as urgent yeah. as that. And what yeah. you've done in making it so available and clear to us is a heroic and gorgeous achievement and a great, great blessing for the world. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Andrew.